All right, so let's get going and talk about Skyland Photofauna. So one of the things I love to start with when talking about this project is why, why set a camera and document animals that appear in front of the camera? Well, the bottom line is we really can't take care of the species around us do good conservation activities if we don't know where they are. And this something throughout my career, I've always been really struck with the fact that, sure, we know generally where some species are very frequent. We don't know where they show up infrequently with those rare events. We don't truly know the whole range of all these species and it's changing all the time. So the more of us that crowdsource this kind of data, share information in an unbiased way about animal observations 24 hours a day from our home cameras can really help build out a better perspective about the distribution of species that we all care about. So the Photofauna Network um, has been growing for about almost two years. We're coming up on two, uh, almost two years in October, and we've had almost 2,000 monthly checklists that have been submitted from volunteers from around the region. And this is a map just showing the distribution of where cameras are that have been reporting checklists over the last two years or so. And it's a project that has a lot of supporters and other partner organizations that are involved. And you can see from the partner list, we've got parks, other conservation organizations, universities that have cameras out on the landscape. They may be collecting wildlife photographs for other purposes, but are helping to share the data into the Photofono network so that we all can have access to the same information. It's a great way to pool a simple amount of data from each of our cameras. So how do we get started? Well, we get started, the first thing we do is you have to figure out how to select a camera. Um, even if you have cameras, you might be thinking you need a slightly different camera. It becomes a bit of an obsession and you might start to want to try all different kinds of cameras. That's okay. You're in good company if that's if you're like me. <laughs> um, there is a lot of art and science and how you actually set up your camera in order to get the photographs that you're looking for and, and to calibrate the settings and the direct placement of the camera. We'll talk through some of those aspects. We'll talk a little bit about how to learn the mammal identification. Um, this is something you may already know a lot about, or this might be brand new for you. I'm just gonna go over a few highlights and then share more resources with you about how you can have a guide with you as you're processing your photographs and how you can learn to distinguish some of the species that are most often mixed up, like the different skunk species or jackrabbits, sometimes even the deer can be tricky. And then we'll talk through the basics of what it means to actually submit a monthly checklist from your home camera. Okay, so starting with uh, how do you select a trail camera that's right for you? There's no right or wrong answer here. People use all kinds of cameras throughout the Photofauna network, so you're not required to use any specific kind. Um, we do want you to use a camera that's recording 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not necessarily continuously, but that it's operational. And if it's motion activated, it's able to take the photographs when something triggers it, like an animal walks or flies by. So what you have to think about if you're brand new to this is, well, how close is the camera gonna be to your house? That may affect the sort of decisions you have when you're, you're combing through the different options. Um, are you in a really sunny habitat or shadier? That might affect whether you wanna go with something that has a solar panel, <laughs> something like that. Um, are you willing to change the batteries and maintain the camera more manually, meaning you have to go put a memory card in the camera and swap it? Um, and think about your budget. We have a really low budget camera that we recommend and I use it around my house and I'm pretty satisfied with it. I'll talk about that model. Our research grade cameras that we use um, throughout of our, our, our science projects are about run around $160, but they can be much more expensive than that. But you can get a terrific camera around the $100 mark. Um, so you do have a lot of options. These are the three cameras. I, I get no kickback from these companies. These are just ones that I personally use and have experience with. And they're sort of representative of lots of things that are on the market. Every year, more and more cameras come online. They're getting better and better. 
they take higher quality photographs, um, they miss fewer animals that go by. Um, so they're just getting really, really good. So this first one, the My Days P40, they keep changing what the model number is. So uh, the, the P40 is what's available right now. And I put the price in red because it had dropped. Um, last time I checked, it was 67, but currently now on Amazon, it's only 56 bucks. So this is a really good deal. Um, this is a great camera. It, and I'm gonna go over the pros and cons and a little bit more about those, um, this one versus the other models. The Browning Strike Force uh, is one that I use quite a bit. It's what we use in all of our research projects. I have them around my house. It's a great, really good, like middle of the line camera. And so you can't go wrong if that's within your budget. The Browning cameras are really, really good. And a very different model is something like a home security camera, which does great, especially for larger mammals. It may miss some of the small stuff, um, but it's a very different approach to wildlife monitoring. And I'll talk about some of the pros and cons next. Okay, so if you think about buy, buying the camera is the first step, but then there's always peripheral things that you need to have alongside, along with it. So for the two cameras on the left, they're traditional trail cameras or wildlife cameras, which means they're gonna be remotely operated. They don't need to be near your house. You can actually place them just about anywhere you want. The one on the left, the MyDays takes eight AA batteries. You could get rechargeable batteries and put them in there if you want. I know some people do that. It has a limit to the total size of the memory card, just something to be aware of. Um, so if you're looking for really high resolution videos, for example, and you don't wanna check your camera very often, you'll have trouble with your memory card filling up with a Midas because it is a sensitive camera. It will get triggered a lot and it can fill up. And there's the, the memory card just is can't be that big, unfortunately for the, for this model. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, it comes with a mounting strap in the Arizona sun and the Sonoras and sun. You have to replace these nylon straps kind of often if they're out in a sunny place. So that is something, another recurring cost. You might have to replace the strap over time every year, every two years, probably. Um, the security case and lock doesn't come with it. So this is the biggest problem with that. This one is you'll have to find some other security case that would fit this model and I don't have one to recommend. So that's the biggest issue. The Midas is great if it's if you're not worried about security, somebody walking away with it. But if you feel like you really need a locked camera, you're either going to have to work to find something that will fit this camera or choose another model that comes with a security case or what we call a bear box because the bears mess with them too. <laughs> the Browning takes fewer batteries. Um, it can accommodate much larger uh, memory cards, which is nice. So you can record a lot more on the same memory card or do higher resolution photography with it. Um, very easy to get a security case that fits it perfectly, which is nice, and with a cable lock that comes through it. So if you're putting it in a place where you're afraid people might see it and walk away with your camera, it's a good, it's a good model to lock up. It's an easy one to get. You can buy the Brownings and probably many different venues. Amazon has them sometimes. The place that I recommend buying this camera, and I'm gonna put it in the chat, um, is Trail Cam Pro. And it's just, um, they have lots of different camera varieties and really good customer service. They are actually giving us a discount for new Photofauna folks. It's only one time, but any, you'll get 15% off your order. And I'm going to type it in here. So there's the discount code from Trail Camp Pro. And you can get a package if you buy the Browning um, from them that comes with the bear box and the memory cards and even a first set of batteries and things like that. So that's that can be really nice if you're interested in that. Um, if you joined after I pasted this in the chat, just a reminder, here's the, a quick reference guide that has a lot of the information that I'm sharing in the presentation so you don't feel like you have to take notes really fast. Okay, so oops, going back. So the Google Nest. I, this was the first wildlife camera that I started using um, really because I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know how to use wildlife cameras. And this one, you just set it up. 
It plugs into an outdoor outlet, so it needs to be near my house. There may be some that are battery operated, but my only experience is one that actually has a cord and plugs into an outlet. And then it connects to my home Wi-Fi. What I love about it is that it streams to my phone and gives me an alert when it sees something, which is really fun. I've been sitting here doing a Zoom meeting and got an alert on my phone that there was a badger outside and it was at my water bowl and I was able to run over to the window and see it. So that happens occasionally. I also go to a lot of alerts for things like morning doves. I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of interesting that way. It's a more expensive camera. These are around $200. There are other kinds of home security cameras you could use. I think the things to be aware of is you may have to buy some sort of online cloud service to store the backup of all of the video that it's recording. Because instead of the motion activated recording like trail cameras have, it's always continuously recording. So you can go backwards in time. It's a security camera. It usually has a really wide angle because it's trying to keep you know, a lot in view around your house, which can be good, but it tends to not have the closest, clearest images of animals, and it might miss some of the smaller animals that come by. So there's pros and cons, but the convenience of it is really, is really nice. I actually have um, a Browning and a Google Nest together. <laughs> I'm, I'm that crazy. I have them together. I use the Browning to take the better photographs, but I like to know what's coming by um, more immediately with the with the security camera. I, but I'm a special case. I do know that. <laughs> um, okay, so you can't go wrong. Try a different camera. For photo funny, you'll definitely be able to get great images from probably whatever camera you try. So go ahead and get yourself a camera. And then is the fun part of learning how to use it and getting it set up. So installing the camera, there's some basic things to keep in mind. You're going to want to find a place. The best location is a place where you have something interesting to watch. You think it's a place where many animals are going by. There's some center of activity. Um, and I'll go through some different ideas for this. But you also need a sturdy mounting structure. So that could be a tree. It could be a fence post. It could be a random found object. Like I used a cinder block here that seems to be working in this particular location right outside my window. Um, a big rock. You can put in a T post. T posts work reasonably well. Um, and they actually do sell mounting brackets for, for cameras that you can attach right to your uh, T post if you want. So the key thing is the flimsier it is, the more it moves around. You're going to get false triggers and it's going to annoy you. You're going to have a lot of extra photographs of nothing to sift through. So the sturdier the post is, the object is that you mount your camera to, the easier. Um, just a, something to keep in mind. You can, you, you will be most happy, I think, with your wildlife photographs if you actually have your camera much lower than you would think. Really just a foot to a foot and a half above the ground gives you this nice perspective with the animal in view. Um, you, of course, you can play around with it. We have some that are up as high as three feet. You just have to play around with the angle to make sure it's pointing down at where you think the animals are moving in front of the camera if you, do, if you have it mounted higher. Generally, it's best if you can to avoid having the camera facing directly east or directly west. And that's because when the sun is rising or setting, that sun, those sun rays are going directly into your camera lens and it, it obscures a lot of the, the images. So you won't get clear images when the sun is near the horizon. So it's the best to just try to angle it so it's facing a little bit more north or a little bit more south. Um, the biggest thing, and this is sort of, you don't, sometimes you can't tell if it's gonna be a problem until you test your camera in a location, is that waving plants will be the bane of your existence. If you have grass that's tall, that's waving around, even the slightest breeze will start to move those plants. And these cameras now are so sensitive that they will start taking pictures or starting to take video. And that's really boring to click through to get past all of those false triggers because of waving vegetation. Generally, facing a creosote bush is really not a good idea. <laughs> creosote bushes really move a lot um, in the wind and grass, those are the two most likely culprits, but it could be there's a tree behind the camera and occasionally in a big windstorm, you're gonna get a branch coming down in front. It's just something to watch for. 
It's hard to prevent all waving vegetation, but it is just another one of those factors when you're trying to figure out what's a good place for your camera. Okay, so some tips, um, additional things to, to try. I think with wildlife photography like this, you have to just try it and see if you're you're getting good perspective on where animals are moving. Um, but generally, if you can imagine that you're you're photographing a game trail, if you put it directly on facing perpendicular to the game trail, that means you're just getting a narrow field of view and the animal is going to go by really quickly. If you have the option to angle a little bit more and see the animal approaching down the trail or down a wash, that tends to give you more options to get a really clear photograph. So the, that's a little thing that you can, can try to play around with is the angle on how far the field of view is gonna capture the animal's movement. Animals move everywhere and they don't always follow where you think they're gonna go, but it's just something to think about if you do have a game trail or a wash in particular that you really wanna monitor. Great. Um, other things to think about. So I mentioned this issue with the height of the camera. Most ground isn't perfectly level, and it may not be totally apparent to you when you're setting your camera just how angled the ground is, um, but it's really something to think about. Even I'm a pretty experienced user at this point, and I have still messed it up sometimes where I got the angle wrong, and I was just missing the bottom foot uh, above the ground and I missed some great detections. So you do need to modify the angle of the camera to make sure you're, um, imagine where the animal's feet are gonna land on the ground and you wanna make sure that's in the field of view of your camera. There are a couple things that you can have ready if, if you have them in your house. Um, one, a laser pointer can really help double check you. You can hold it up in parallel with your camera and see where the lens is actually shooting onto the ground. Just a nice quick way to see line of sight. You also can take test images, run in front of the camera, print, prance like a deer, um, and see if you are in the field of view as you expect it to be, and then make adjustments if you're not. Um, you don't really need actual shims, but it can be helpful to have some rocks or even some twigs to help adjust my tiny adjustments in the angle of your camera. If you have it strapped to a tree, it's going to start being flush. You know, it's going to be directly up and down. But if you need to angle it at all towards the ground, you might need to stuff something behind the camera at the top to help it hold that angle. We use a lot of really low budget things that we find at our field sites, like branches and rocks and things like that to get the perfect angle. And that's totally fine to do. Everyone does it. <laughs> Okay, so we talked generally about setting that camera up, um, but where do you even start when finding a location? And a great thing to do is any kind of area where you have a lot of traffic of animals, you're probably aware of where you're seeing tracks, paw prints on the ground, or you see animals moving in an area. Washes are great. They do tend to be highways for a lot of species, or maybe you have a game, known game trail. You see deer walking along a certain path, something like that. Anything um, that constrains the animal's movement so they have to go through a certain area to navigate around your property, it could be the side of your house, um, that's a great place to put a camera because animals are more likely to travel through it. So just think about where animals are most likely to move, and that can be a nice thing to start with. Water. Water does attract animals. Um, you can still see most of the animals in a region not near a water source. So don't feel like the only place to put a camera is near a water source. But if you do, even a small bowl of water is enough to bring animals in. I mentioned the badger that comes to my house. Um, I have an, a nest camera on a block of wood right outside of my window. And it's just, it's literally three or four feet away from this water bowl. And here's a badger coming in the summer to lay on her back. This is a mother badger that had two offspring that year and she just needed to cool off. I could totally understand. So water can be really fascinating um, to, to watch for sure. And I, again, keep your camera low, you know, be eye level with the animals. You'll really love the images that you get if you keep your camera pretty low. Also, burrows are really interesting. That The first photo I showed you um, of the cinder block with a camera, that's a burrow that I've been watching for many years. Um, and burrows are really interesting. All kinds of animals come in and out of them, not even the animal that created it. So here's a badger coming out of this burrow, but I've had 
different squirrel species come through. I've had Gila monsters emerge out of the burrow that I watch. It's really fascinating to see what's there. And then just the parade of all the animals in the area. Eventually they cross through any patch of ground. <laughs> in our region, we have so much life. We're really, really lucky. So I don't think you can go wrong. Anywhere around your property where you feel comfortable leaving a camera, you set your camera up and see what shows up and you'll be surprised. A lot of animals are gonna, are gonna be there. Okay, so you find your location, you figure out how you're going to mount it, but of course you need to set up the camera settings itself. Cameras, usually if you're using a trail camera, it's going to need a memory card um, and you're going to need batteries. So some cameras come with a solar panel or you can buy a solar panel, but most people just rely on disposable batteries. Um, I'm showing lithium batteries here. This is a tip that I learned the hard way. Um, if you're new at this, when it gets cold, when the temperature drops into the 30s or below, alkaline batteries can't, won't work anymore. And so you, your camera's not gonna be able to operate in the winter in a colder climate uh, with alkaline batteries. So lithium's certainly more expensive. They're harder to get right now for sure. But for those winter months, it is important to use lithium. Otherwise, you won't get any night, especially any nighttime images that are clear or your flat, your camera won't be able to fire at all under with alkaline. Okay, so get the basics in there, get your memory card in, get your batteries in, you can turn it on. Um, mostly I'm talking about some key settings that have to do with this Browning model, but these cameras are all really pretty sim similar and they're usually their manuals are pretty good. First thing you wanna do is you wanna set the date and time. It's really common for these cameras to drift over time. So every time you check your camera, it's a really good practice to double check that the date and the time is still correct. The time may change by a few minutes. If the batteries have died, it may reset itself back to the year 2020. So be in the habit of checking that whenever you look at your camera. You can program in um, a camera name and that'll show up at the information bar then on the photographs when you download them, which is really helpful. So you could give it something like, the location and your initials. Um, if you've got lots of cameras, you might wanna go with your last name and a number. This can help you keep things organized. And it also helps when you submit your, your data to the Photofauna project to share your camera name. So we're encouraging people, it's optional, but we encourage you to give it uh, a camera name to keep, keep that camera location straight. Then you get to make this choice for most cameras, whether to do video or photography, actually still photographs. The Mighty, My Days, that, that cheaper model that I showed you can actually do both. It can record a video and then take still photographs. Um, but the Browning here, you have to choose one or the other. We typically, for research, do photographs. You can set it to do a single photograph or to do a burst of however many photos you want. This is really your choice. If you don't mind looking through more photographs and you want to make sure you get the prancing deer in the perfect position, take a, a larger burst, take three or five photographs. But if you're worried about space or you don't have the patience to look through a lot of photographs, then maybe just do a single photograph and that's gonna be the fastest and simplest thing for you. I, at, at home, I love to get videos because I like to see the animal movement. I'm just personally curious about that. So I collect videos. And it takes a little bit longer, of course, to watch the videos than it would be to look through photographs. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but you get to see animals doing all kinds of interesting things, and I really enjoy that. You will need to take a screenshot of your video to create an image then that you can submit to the Photofauna project. So that's something to keep in mind. There'll be one extra step if you're recording videos and not photographs. You'll have to basically, in essence, create a photograph from your video when you submit your checklist. <clears throat> Little trick of the trade has to do with the capture delay. So these cameras now are usually pretty good. They can keep really rapidly firing if an animal is moving and doing all kinds of stuff in front of the camera. It can keep triggering or you can tell it, oh, if it's taken a photograph, don't take another photograph for 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, five minutes. You get to set that. Um, this is a strategy if you are really committed to monitoring in a place that's going to have a lot of vegetation motion, you might decide 
it's worth it to me to have my camera there, but I'm going to set a larger capture delay so it's not triggering every five seconds, that it's only going to trigger once a minute, and that can reduce the total number of photographs. Something to play around with. Um, it really depends on how much is happening in front of your camera and your capacity and interest to go through extra, extra images or videos. Um, the last thing that I'll mention here is just some cameras have a setting, are you trying to do fast motion or long range? And that has to do with whether you're, you're monitoring um, where animals are moving very close by. That scenario that it showed in that schematic where you have a trail going by, and if your camera is pointed right at it, and you can imagine a deer running by really fast, that's a situation where it's fast motion, they can optimize the, the camera settings by choosing fast motion to be really quick to trigger. Um, or there's a trade-off with a longer range sensor. So if you know that you're monitoring a big open area and you don't know if the animal is gonna be close or far away, you might choose the long range setting. These are things to just try. It depends on your particular location and camera. Okay, the last thing is when you're setting up your camera is record where your camera is, not just so you can find it again, <laughs> but we are going to ask you for the location of your camera. Um, you may already know exactly where your camera is and be able to look at, at a Google map and find the coordinates. That's great. Otherwise, if you're able to carry a mobile phone with you when you go to your camera, you can open the Google Maps app and see where your blue location indicator is. If you set your finger down over that point, um, and hold for a second, it will drop a pin. And then if you look down on the information that comes up in that dropped pin, um, then you'll get the, the GPS coordinate, the latitude, comma, longitude, and this is in decimal degrees. So a great thing to do is to keep a text file in your computer, especially if you have multiple cameras with the name of the camera and this coordinate. And then every time you go to submit your checklist for Photofauna, you can just copy and paste that right into the checklist. It also allows you in the, the Photofauna form to find it on a map, but that can be inaccurate. And then sometimes each of your checklists might come in under a slightly different coordinate. So the best thing is to do is, if you can, is figure out your best coordinate and then use that over and over when you submit your checklist. Okay, you bought your camera. You set it up, you tried a bunch of things, you review your photographs. If you set up a wildlife camera, especially if it's your first time, definitely check it the next day or within a few days, because most likely there's something you're going to need to change. You're going to realize there's a plant that's irritating you that's waving or, oh shoot, I had the angle just wrong. I want to, I want to <clears throat> swing it around or I want to angle it down. You might want to modify some of the settings. So it's a really good idea to check your camera right away as you're getting used to the camera in a new location. Once you're up and running, you can let it go a lot longer than that. And it's really up to you how often you check your camera. But the photographs that you get can be so great. For me, whenever I go and pull a memory card out of a camera, it's kind of like Christmas, just trying to figure out, you know, I can't wait to see what's on there, open it up and see what's on there. It's a really fun surprise. Um, these are all photographs that we've taken from Browning cameras in the around the border near the San Rafael Valley. They can be really amazing photographs of animals because these cameras are operating when we're not there and animals just go, go about their daily business day and night doing their thing in front of the cameras. And then we have the privilege of getting to see it. There's a roadrunner <laughs> flying at the camera. An American kestrel. Red tail hawk coming in to perch on the camera. We get a lot of cameras, especially in grasslands covered in bird poo. They love to sit on our cameras. Um, and even reptiles. So when this whole field of wildlife um, tra trail cameras started being used in research, they really were designed for large mammals, maybe medium mammals, but that was it. Everyone said, oh, we'll never detect reptiles. They're not for birds. Okay, but they, they do detect these animals and you will see them and they're fantastic. So um, here's a beautiful snake that showed up. So they're really designed really for mammals, but I'm just gonna tell you, you're gonna get a lot of other species too. 
you're even going to get insects. Um, I've had honeybees and different kinds of bees trigger cameras around my house. They pick up butterflies. It's pretty amazing what they're they're able to capture. They're so good nowadays. But this is a joke that will resonate more with you as you go through more and more <laughs> wildlife photographs. They're not all mountain lions and, and jaguar and things like that on camera. Unfortunately, for most of us, we get a lot of morning doves. And so it's just something to be prepared for. After the annoyance of waving vegetation, probably morning doves, even though they're very sweet birds, um, they can be really frustrating. It's really common to have a lot of morning dove detections. So just something to be prepared for. This is a photograph I've, I've had, I can't even tell you how many times. Just a pair of morning doves sitting in front of the camera, you know, doing a wing stretch, taking a bath, but just triggering the camera over and over and over again. We have a camera at a spring in Karchner, Cavern State Park, and every month we're getting 5,000 morning dove photos. Uh, it's like a flock of morning doves just descend on the spring, and then they just move enough to trigger the camera like all night long. It's pretty crazy. Um, so that's part and parcel with doing wildlife <laughs> of photography in our area. Okay, so I'm just going to walk you through what you'll be looking for as you're going through all of your photographs. We have 44 different species on our checklist, and it doesn't matter whether the animal shows up one time in a calendar month or is there every day. We're just looking to know whether the species was present or absent during the month. So all it takes is one sighting of an animal, and then we will count that as yes on your checklist for photofauna. So we have canines, we've got coyote, gray fox, and kit fox, not commonly observed, but it is on our list. We've got hoofed animals. We've got the javelina, white-tailed deer, mule deer. We have pronghorn, bighorn sheep, and elk. The cats, of course, we've got four cats of our region. They've all been detected on cameras within the network. So we've bobcat, mountain lion, Ocelot, Jaguar. Cottontails. Now, cottontails are basically impossible to differentiate the eastern from the desert cottontail with photograph alone. So if it's a cottontail, you can submit it under the same category. That's no problem. We use an elevational analysis to figure out whether it's likely to be a uh, desert versus an eastern cottontail. We also have the two jackrabbits, black-tailed and ant antelope jackrabbit. Other birds that we that hear the birds, we look at Gamble's quail, roadrunner, Cooper's hawk, turkey vulture. We also ask you to let us know if you're seeing Gould's turkey or gray hawk. There are so many birds in our region. You are welcome to submit other observations, and there's a field on the form for additional um, birds that you want to submit. There are many other places you can share bird data as well, but these are the particular species that we see most readily on our cameras and that we're tracking um, their distribution through photofauna. Here's just some examples of the different birds that are not on the checklist that get submitted um, from our photofauna participants. It's really exciting always to see what people are seeing on their cameras. Some of the best photographs are of birds. Okay, the raccoon family, of course, raccoon, um, and then ringtail and white-nosed coati. Then the rodents, got a lot of rodents on our checklist. Um, we don't have rats and mice. So the smallest rodents we do not have included in the checklist, but just like birds, if you have photographs of rodents that you wanna share that are not on the checklist, there's space for you to do that. We focus on rock squirrel, Harris's antelope squirrel and round-tailed ground squirrel, Arizona gray squirrel, Abbott's, Abbott squirrel, and the cliff chipmunk. Then the bigger rodents of the area, the North American porcupine and beaver. The skunks, and I'm gonna come back to the skunks and, and talk a little bit more about identifying them in a minute, but. There's four skunks in our region, hooded, hog-nosed, striped, and western spotted skunk. 
They're some of my favorite animals to get on camera. I had a lot of hooded skunks around my house in 2020 and they've disappeared. And that's one of the things I'm hoping we can use the photofauna data for is to understand where we see species maybe retracting, going through some sort of population decline, where animals might be moving into new territory. So we're really interested in, in, in seeing that as we accumulate these checklists over the region and over the months and years ahead. Other species that are in their own families here, we, we look for back, black bear, badger, long-tailed weasel. Any bat observations that you get on your camera, you're welcome to submit. They can be difficult to identify, but we're, you're, happy, you're welcome to submit them. Um, this is a lesser long-nosed bat. So if you happen to have a hummingbird feeder in the view of your camera, you, and if you're in Tucson, you might be getting um, these bats coming by. They look like they have skinny jeans. They don't have the, the tail in between their legs. We have the uh, Sonoran um, Virginia opossum. This is a subspecies of the Virginia opossum. You can identify it from Virginia opossum in other parts of North America because it has a really characteristic dark half to its tail. It's light at the tip and dark at the base. And then we also have room for um, reptiles. If you want to submit them, we get desert tortoises and Gila monsters. The only one we list on the checklist by name is Gila monster, but you can submit any other species that you observe. Okay, so once you start to get familiar with the species around your area, one of the biggest tasks is just organizing your photographs. I'm not gonna tell you how to do it. Everyone is gonna have a system that works best for them. But in case you're wondering where to start, I'm just sharing with you what I personally do. I have a lot of different cameras, um, but I keep a special folder just for my photo fauna checklists and I save them by month. And within each month, month, excuse me, I have a subfolder for each camera. You're always gonna only submit photographs from a single camera each month. So if you have two cameras around your house, you would either just choose one of them to submit or you'd submit two separate checklists. So for me, um, from June this year, I had a burrow camera checklist and I had a wash camera checklist. And within each folder, I've got a copy of the photos with the common name in the label. And that means when I submit my checklist, all I have to do is go to this folder and I can easily upload all of the species photographs for the animals that I have on my checklist. Okay. All right. So this is kind of like playing bingo every month. Okay. It's really fun to see which animals you have in front of your camera. And really what you're doing for a single month is you're just looking for this presence or absence. So you're literally checking it off. Remember, you just need one photograph of each species and then it counts on, on your, you know, photo on a bingo board, if you will. So you could imagine you've set your camera, let's say you set your camera up in the next week and then it runs through all of October. So then in the beginning of November, you could submit an October checklist. So you probably didn't get all of the species. It's really common to only have a handful um, in any given month. But let's say in your camera, these are this is the set of species that you observed. So you somewhere in your computer, hopefully you've saved um, a folder with the camera name, the month, and the year. That's going to make it really easy for you to remember and keep track of your photo fauna photos. You would save a photograph of each of the species that you detected on your camera. Now, the first month, you might get really lucky and have some amazing animals in there, or it might take some patience. Remember, your camera just has a limited field of view. The animals might be present. It might walk right around your camera, but not go right in front of it. Doesn't mean that the animal is not there if you don't have a photograph of it. The longer you let your camera run, the more likely you're, you're gonna get the full species list over time. And the photo fauna project tracks that species richness, the total number of species that occur on your camera in successive months. So keep going with your camera. You'll see more and more, I promise. So here's a scenario. Let's say on the top, these are diff five different months where you were doing photo fauna. Um, 
If you only did it for five months, you could imagine your total species list could be eight. You could have these species, for example, that you've seen over five months. But if you keep letting it run, let's say for another two months, you might jump up and then all of a sudden you've got 11 species. And that happens really commonly. I want to talk to you about one of the cameras that we have down near the border in the San Rafael. Um, we've detected all four of the skunk species in the same month. And our wildlife biologist was really excited when this happened. She's like, oh, we've got skunk bingo. She was so excited. Um, and here's why. She had been plotting along, analyzing the data from this camera for a long time. What this graph is showing you is the total number of checklists per month that had a different that had these species present. So the red the red stripe here right here this is hooded skunk. So the very first skunk that was seen on this camera was a hooded skunk. Then probably in month um, month 4 we finally got a hognose skunk. Got a couple more hogs hognose skunk observations then got some more um, hooded skunk. It wasn't until around 20 months that we finally got a spotted skunk and a striped skunk. And then here it is, you know, this is like 43 months when they all happened at the same time. So there's no way that just one month of your data collection will give you the full species list. The longer you let your camera run, over time, you're going to build up and get the full picture of what species are around you. And that's why we really encourage people to keep their cameras up as long as you as long as you can, because we're going to learn more and more about the wildlife in your region when you do that. So you're thinking four skunks. Uh, that's a lot to differentiate, and it can be. Um, often the striped skunks and the hooded skunks get confused. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details of how you can tell these animals apart, but there are some really important things to know about that. Um, the, the white stripe on a striped skunk always meets on the shoulders, so it kind of makes a V or a, or a Y pattern on its back. A hooded skunk could be all white, it could have white stripes, but it's not going to have that characteristic V right here. Um, and if you think it's confusing because hooded skunks look have looked really different and they sometimes they look like cogno skunks and sometimes they look like striped skunks, this is why we've documented eight different color variations for just the hooded skunk alone. And I love to use this um, illustration by our wildlife specialist, Megan Bethel, because it just shows that there's so, it takes a long time to get to know the animals in your area to realize the nuance and their color patterns, you will may be able to recognize specific individual skunks because they have unique um, coloration. So this makes it tricky at first when you're trying to identify different species. Um, but over time, you're going to really grow to appreciate about that. And the more we have looked through millions of wildlife photographs as part of our program, um, and, and our research at Skyland Alliance, and we're realizing that more and more species, the closer we look, have a lot more variation in their their physical features than, than we would think at first. If you get stuck, just ask us. We're really happy to look at a photograph if you're not sure it is before you submit your, your checklist. We also will um, check every single photograph that comes in and we will let you know if there's a misidentification, we'll give you some tips. We'll let you know why we think it's something else. I put Megan's email address here, Megan at skyislandalliance.org. She's our expert, and you're welcome to email her if you have identification questions. Okay, yeah, go back to the one slide. Here we go. Yep, so just had a comment in the chat to go back and to look at these differences. Partly we're showing these kind of photographs because if you had a perfect image of these animals, it would be really easy to identify them, more likely than not. But these animals are moving. If they're out at night, they might be a little bit blurry. They're hiding behind vegetation. You might only see a part of the animal. So the more that you can get used to learning the different features from the coat pattern, what their head looks like, what their feet look like, it's going to help you because you never know which body part is going to show up and be the clearest. Um, in just a second, I want to paste uh, some resources in here for you. We have a great webinar that Megan um, has given that is listed on this 
link here. I'm going to email these out to you when we're done as well. So don't feel like you have to grab all these links right now. But at this web um, at this web link that I just pasted in the chat, you'd be able to watch a whole hour where she goes through all the tricky to identify species and, and walks through that. And there's also a PDF guide um, that has detailed side by side images and comparisons to how to look at different features of these animals. So the PDF guide is something you might want to actually keep on your computer right with you as you're going through your photographs. Um, but the, the webinar tutorial will maybe helpful to you as well. Okay. So skunk is an often tricky one, but fascinating to look at their coat patterns. Often the two jackrabbits that we have on the checklist can be a little bit confusing, especially if it's a nighttime photo and they're often photographed at night. Jackrabbits are very similar in shape, both the antelope and the black ta black tailed jackrabbit. What I really look for with the antelope jackrabbits are the really characteristic white, silvery white side. Um, it's pretty pronounced, especially in some images of, of the antelope jackrabbit. Um, but occasionally we see a black tailed jackrabbit with just the way the lighting is, it kind of looks like they've got a light side that can be confusing. But for black tailed jackrabbit, you're really looking at the size of the tail. Um, you're looking for the dark coloration on the tail and the tips of their ears as well. The deer, um, some of you might be just know automatically when you look at your deer or you know based on your elevation or your vegetation type, which type of deer you're more likely to have. Some people live in a place where you do have both. You've got white-tailed and mule deer. So um, we certainly have that in places where we're doing research. So some of the things that we look at, we look for this brown patch on the forehead for the mule deer. It's really pretty characteristic, both for male and for females. White-tailed deer have a nice white um, fur patch around the, around the nose and mouth. That can be really distinctive and helpful. The, the antlers, the way the antlers grow are different. So if you have bucks and you have a good view of their antlers, you might be able to tell the difference. Um, with a mule deer, the, the antlers are, are forking like this as they grow. And with a white-tailed deer, it's like it's coming off the same plane. And then you've got um, the, the points that come off of one main, main shaft of the antler. So sometimes that helps if you have clear antler view, views. Um, the tail is also really distinctive. It's dark and rope-like on a mule deer. White-tailed deer is fluffy and, and certainly lighter in color. But then occasionally, and at my house, I get mule deer that come by occasionally, but they always walk right by the camera and I keep my cameras low. So I only see the legs. So how can you identify these deer just from the legs? Well, you can look at the metatarsal gland. Yes, you, this is something you never knew you needed to know, but <laughs> on, these, um, on these animals' legs, especially on the hind legs, you can see this longer patch right here on a mule deer and it's um, smaller and lower on the leg on a white-tailed deer. And I've actually identified deer just using these glands. Um, it can be helpful depending on what's visible. If you have deer in big grasslands, you can't see their legs. This isn't gonna help you. So this is just going back to the point. It's good to get familiar with all different kinds of traits because you you're, don't know what part of the animal is gonna show up and be the clearest for identification. Um, when you're reviewing your photographs. Okay, it looks like we've got a question. So Lee has switched to videos, uses lithium batteries, has Brownings and the battery says 100%. Um, and then the video, at the end of the video goes black. Well, lithiums are really funny. Um, unlike an alkaline battery that predictably kind of tapers off in its performance over time, lithium will stay at 100% and then it'll die. So it is, is not uncommon for that to happen um, where you'll check it, seems like the battery's fine, and then it could be a day later the batteries actually decline. So that's one of the annoying things um, about those batteries. It could be battery decline. Um, it, there could be something with the card itself turning off or there could be some kind of camera setting. My suspicion is that it's probably the lithium batteries reaching the end of their life. 
Any other questions before I move on to how to submit a checklist? All right, well, feel free to speak up or continue to write in the chat if there's anything you want me to address. And I'll, I'll save more time for questions when I get through this part too. Okay, so submitting a checklist. Now, the main thing that we ask is that the checklist is for one camera in one location for one month. And we emphasize this because when we started the project, we were having some problems with people compiling photographs from different cameras together to have a more complete checklist. And we actually don't want you to do that. We will combine the data once it's all submitted if cameras are close together, but we'd rather have independent checklists. And the reason for that is cameras are in their own specific location with vegetation type, proximity to road, all kinds of things affect that particular camera. And we want the unique checklist just to match one camera site. If you move your camera during the month, then it's not gonna be a great month to submit a checklist or you're gonna need to just submit for half of it. Um, so just try to remember it's one camera, one location for one month. You can always submit multiple checklists. And I do that around my house. I live on three acres and sometimes I submit it up to four different checklists based on my cameras around my property. So to go ahead and um, to do the checklist, you can get all of this from our website, but I'll, I'll paste it into the chat so you have, so that you have the link. Oops, so I can copy and paste it correctly. There we go. This is the portal that you'll use when it's time to submit your checklist. Um, I'm going to walk through the basics of it. I'm not going to go through how you, you fill it out. It should be fairly self-explanatory. It's broken down into basic sections. The first one is contact information. We just need that in case our wildlife specialists have any questions about your, your identifications or your checklist, or to let you know that you're a winner in our photography contest, and I'll come back to that. So we ask for at least your name and, a, and an email address that we can contact you. We do ask you if you prefer to be contacted in English or Spanish because we have wildlife specialists on both sides of the border. We want to know who should contact you, depending on your language preference. And then we ask quite a bit of information about your camera. Part of it is to confirm that it's only one camera, one location, and for which month you're submitting. So if it was the first week, uh, or let's say you're you already have a camera out and you can submit a, a checklist for August, you would select August 2022 and you'd be eligible to submit that checklist now that it's September. Um, we ask you to enter in either find on the map widget in the portal or to copy and paste your GPS coordinate for your camera in there and make sure it looks right to you on the map. That's really helpful to make sure there isn't an error somewhere. So you can paste it into the map box and hit enter and it should zoom right to where your camera is, and that should be great. We keep this confidential. We do not reveal the exact location of your submission, and I'll, I'll go into more information about that. Here's an example of my home, and I have all my cameras because I'm nuts. <laughs> and what we do is when we show any of the data in a mapped format, we randomize the location of any camera submissions to within about 0.6 miles of the true location. It's the thousand meters, which means if you look at our photo fun and maps, you might think that's not where my camera is um, or wow, there's a camera on my house and I didn't submit anything. It just might be that you have a neighbor that has a camera and it's randomized on top of your house. We do this to protect the wildlife in your area and also the location of your camera and your privacy. We also ask in the camera section if there's drinkable water for wildlife within 50 feet of your camera. This is just an estimate. Um, in some places, it might be a wash that's only wet very ephemerally just in a couple months of the year, or it could be a spring that's mostly wet but occasionally runs dry, um, or it could be water that's out all the time. So we want to know what it was for the last month, for the month that you're reporting on. And we are using that to understand, are we seeing some species only in close proximity to water? Um, does the influence of water affect which species are in certain places? So it's helpful for us to know um, if there's water by your camera. Doesn't matter how much water, it's just could an animal, animal actually have taken a drink from some 
body of water, even for just a, a short amount of time during the month, that would be enough to select yes. The last thing on the camera information um, is just have you detected people or domesticated animals on your camera? This is another covariate. We just are really curious to know. Um, are you seeing people, not you checking the camera, but are you near a trail? Is there a lot of traffic of people or vehicles, livestock or domestic dogs? These are all factors that might influence which species we see around your camera. So it's, you don't need to count the number of photographs that you have of these things. Just use your best guess after reviewing your images and decide whether it was never a few days of the month or most days. All right, then it's gonna walk you through the different families um, and it's all set to the default of no, that you didn't observe the species, but if you get to the first section canines and you did have a coyote, then you select yes, and then you upload your coyote photo and move on down the checklist. Lastly, we give you a lot of space to add any extra photographs that you wanna share with us. We love seeing extra submissions, interesting behaviors or funny photographs that you get. And we do ask you for your permission to use the photographs and communications. They won't be associated ever with your location. Um, but if you give us permission, then we'll be able to add you to our photo contests. And at the end of the year, we always do a fun photo contest where the public votes on the best photographs. And it's really fun to see what everybody submits. Here's a bear wallowing. <laughs> This is a picture from Sonora of some black bear. So lastly, I'm just going to leave you um, with a reminder that you can go and see any of the data and use our Explorer tool through our results dashboard. Um, it's a map, interactive map, where you can zoom in and look and learn more about what people are observing around you. Of course, they're not exactly in the right point, but they're within half about half a mile of the tree location. Um, on our dashboard, you can click on a specific point and see the species list that's popped up. The, the blue dots are cameras near water. The yellow dots are cameras that don't have drinkable water within 50 feet. And the size of the point has to do with the species richness. So the bigger circles, those are places where cameras are detecting many more species on our checklist. And you can also click on the species graph at the bottom on any, on any animal um, bar, and it'll show you on the map where that species has been observed. So for this one, the most commonly observed species, we've had over a thousand checklists that do see uh, coyote. They're very common. You can see where they are in the region. Um, and in case you're curious, the most commonly observed species Coyote, javelina, cottontail, bobcat, white-tailed deer, and gambles quail. So with that, um, you can support the project in helping us create camera kits for communities um, to check out. Um, we have one in the Bisbee Library, in the Patagonia Library, and in two universities in Sonora. So um, if you're interested in shopping gear, I'll send out a link to where you can join the photo fauna ranks and, and get yourself some fun gear to wear to represent the project and all the proceeds support this project. And just have fun. Happy wildlife watching. We're really here to answer your questions. You're welcome to contact me. Eamon Herity is our wildlife manager, and um, he runs all of the photo fauna data analysis. Um, I'll share all the contact information in a follow-up email to all of you. And then uh, Megan Bethel, who's our specialist at identifying photographs, you're welcome to, to contact her as well. So with that, we're at five o'clock. I'm really happy to take questions any of you have if you want to unmute and ask me or type them into the chat. Okay, great. So there's a, a really good question about where to put a camera that might have um, the most kind of animal activity that's really important to monitor. Um, generally, we're looking for places where we don't have any cameras. So if you look at the photo fauna map, you can see there are big areas where we don't have any cameras reporting in. I mean, to me, as opposed to a specific type of animal activity, it's more locations. We don't have contributions from New Mexico yet. We really love that. Um, there are big gaps in the map right now. We're interested in the interface 
of urban and more remote wildland areas. So we want people in urban areas to do photofauna. A lot of times people say, oh no, I live in this neighborhood. We won't have any animals. Well, we want to actually document that. And there are often a lot of surprises. We have ringtail in midtown Tucson. They come down. People just don't see them because they come at night. So really a whole variety of locations are interesting. I would say, don't worry about the water source. I feel like people always wanna put them on water and it can be really compelling. But again, you don't need to focus your camera on, on water. We wanna represent all different kinds of habitats in the project. So you really you really can't go wrong. Um, okay, question. Uh, what are the geographic boundaries of the project? Well, we are really, there's no geographic, hard geographic boundary. Many of the species on the checklist occur widely outside of our traditional Sky Island region. Um, we have people starting to report in from further, further away. And that's great because we want to know where these species are beyond our region. So there's anywhere in Arizona, New Mexico, Sonora, even in California, we're super interested. Um, so I would say, Wherever you are, we're still interested. You may have species that are not on our checklist if you're much further afield um, and you may not get all of the same species that someone would get in Southeast Arizona, but that's okay. You can, there's spaces to add additional species. Okay, question about, do we offer stickers um, for the photo fauna project? We do have photo fauna stickers. So if you wanna send me a message about that, we can definitely get you a sticker. I, Stickers are really hard to keep on cameras in our bright, sunny desert <laughs> environment. They often start to fade and, and come off over time. So that's just one thing to note. Um, we've tried a bunch of different labels. We're encouraging people to do this on their own property where they have permission to put the cameras out. What we are doing for research on public lands, we're doing under research permits. So the best thing to do is to put a camera on your own property. Um, but if you're if you already have cameras someplace in a public space and you have permission to do so, we can I can talk with you further about some signage. Yeah, so great question about the recording. I have recorded it. I'm gonna take all of the links that I've shared um, and I'll gather the recording once it's finished processing and I will email this out to all of you. You're welcome to share this information um, with others, anyone who's missed this or might be interested neighbors um, in your community that might wanna join the project. Um, you're welcome to also put somebody new directly in touch with me and I can make sure they they get an orientation, but this will be recorded. I'll be able to get all of this follow up stuff to you probably first thing in the morning. It usually takes Zoom a little while to process the recording and then I can share it. Um, happy to take any other questions that folks have and I was just going to paste the links one more time, oops, into the chat. So here come a whole bunch of links, <laughs> but I will send these by email as well. So in here, the quick reference guide that has a lot of what I've talked about today, the mammal identification resources, which includes a webinar and a PDF where you can look at the side-by-side -side comparison for things like um, the skunks and the deer and, and other species. Um, where you can submit your checklist, that the link directly to go online and submit a checklist. If you want to look at the dashboard, that viewer that I talked about with the map, you can um, see that on that link. And then the bonfire shop is where you can get a hat or a shirt if you're excited um, to wear stuff related to photofauna. And lastly, the Trail Cam Pro um, discount code. It's good for your entire purchase, but it'll only work one time for you with a single email address. Oh, good to know about the, <laughs> the photo font of t-shirts. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining. Please be in touch as you're figuring out what works for you. If you're having challenges with your cameras or figuring out what's go, what wildlife species are appearing, we're here to help you um, and are just really excited to see your submissions. The photo fauna uh, 
the dashboard gets updated every three months. So it's not instant. As soon as you submit a checklist, we review it and validate it, and then it goes in every three months. So there is a little bit of delay to see yourself pop up on the map. Um, but we really hope to start seeing your, your submissions in the coming months.